In the 1930s, Australian farmers had a really big problem. Their sugarcane crops were being decimated by a voracious grub, the larvae of the cane beetle, which destroys the plant's roots. After failed attempts at chemically controlling the grubs, officials sought a biological solution. They thought if they introduced a predator of the beetle, the grub problem would go away. At the time, the thought process wasn't entirely unreasonable, but it would turn out to be the single worst decision they could have made. After hearing about a measure to control a similar cane beetle in Hawaii with the voracious cane toad, Australian officials jumped at the idea. After dutifully carrying out exactly zero studies of the potential impact on the Australian environment, they transported a hundred toads from Hawaii and let them loose. And with that single action, the Australian ecosystem was never the same. 100 toads quickly became 1,000, and then 10,000, and then 10 million, and then 100 million. They have rapidly spread over much of the continent. Today, cane toads, properly known as Bufo marinus or Bufo toads, are the most notorious of all invasive species in Australia. This lumpy guy is massive, poisonous, and seemingly unstoppable. The biggest cane toad ever recorded was almost 40 centimeters or 15 inches long and weighed 6 pounds or 2.75 kilograms. It eats anything it can fit into its mouth. Insects, trash, dog food, small reptiles, small rodents, and even birds. The one thing it doesn't eat though is the cane beetle. Cane beetles perch too high off the ground for cane toads to reach, and the toads certainly can't get to the grubs underground. So you could say there are some regrets. Cane toads are now moving westward at a remarkably fast pace, and the Australian government admits that it's unlikely that they will ever be fully contained. Since their introduction 87 years ago, cane toads have been linked to the decline of several native species in the Northern Territory and Queensland including the Australian monitor lizard, the northern blue-tongued lizard, the Australian water dragon, the king brown snake, the common death adder, and the northern quoll. Many species are at risk of total extinction, all because of this stupid, ugly toad. What is it about the cane toad's particular biology that makes it so destructive and able to spread so easily? Why are some introduced species worse than others, and what can be done to stop them? Invasive species, unfortunately, have become a major part of our modern world. They can be introduced to an area by ship ballast water, accidental release, or, like in the case of the cane toad, by misguided intentional human action. But a common misconception is that any species found living in its non-native habitat is an invasive species. This, however, is not the case. Many species are introduced to new areas without it being a problem. Most crops, for example, are non-native. Potatoes, for example, are from South America, but are now grown on most continents without causing an issue. Honeybees were introduced to the Americas from Europe in the 1600s and have yet to cause any major problem. A species only gets the invasive title when it causes harm to the environment, displaces or outcompetes native species, hurts the economy of the area, or becomes a danger to human, animal, or plant health. The brown tree snake has eaten a dozen kinds of forest birds in Guam to extinction. Zebra mussels clog pipes around the Great Lakes and, speaking from personal experience, shred your feet to a pulp in Lake Travis. House cats murder any creature they can get their paws on if they're let outside, pushing as many as 70 bird, reptile, and small mammal species out of existence already. The kudzu plant is a climbing vine that smothers and outcompetes native plants all over the southeastern United States, and grows up to a foot a day. All of these organisms have found a place to thrive where they didn't originally evolve, meaning other organisms haven't had the time to adapt to their presence. Native organisms don't have defenses against the invaders, methods to compete alongside them, or even ways to prey on them. And the cane toad's particular biology makes it so most of the natural inhabitants of the Australian ecosystem don't stand a chance. Largely because cane toads are extremely poisonous. 
Adult cane toads have venom-secreting poison glands on each shoulder where a highly toxic, milky substance is released when they are threatened. If an animal tries to bite at the toad, the venom is secreted directly into the animal's mouth, and its effect is almost instant. The venom, which is full of cardiac glycosides, causes sodium to build up within the animal's cells. When this happens in heart cells, it completely alters the rhythm of the heart, usually making it beat out of control. Meanwhile, potassium builds up between the cells, which can cause paralysis. This then leads to difficulty breathing, convulsions, and soon after, death. A cane toad's poison can kill within minutes. This makes the cane toad quite an undesirable snack for most animals, especially animals in Australia. In the cane toad's natural habitat of South and Central America, some predators, like the broad-snouted caiman, have evolved mechanisms to block the action of the poison. But similar predators in Australia have not had time to keep up their end of the evolutionary arms race. Freshwater crocodiles in Australia are experiencing mass die-offs due to the very same toad. A study conducted in 2008 saw 77% of freshwater crocodiles die in a period of three years, directly following the inland progression of cane toads from the mouth of the Victoria River. The pace of their deaths exactly matched the pace of the toad's invasion. But all hope is not lost for the crocodiles. Eventually, the high death rate may naturally select for crocodiles that have a higher tolerance to the toad toxin. This is already being observed in some black snake populations that have been hit hard by the cane toads. And other animals are adapting too, in even freakier ways. Australian water rats have learned to flip cane toads over to carve out and eat their hearts with surgical precision, avoiding any toxins. In turn, this could have a positive effect for other native animals. With enough time, maybe there is hope that Australian animals can fight back. But unfortunately, it's not just the adult cane toads that are the problem. Even the eggs and the tadpoles are poisonous, which, if ingested by vertebrate predators like fish and turtles, can be fatal. And this is no small threat. Cane toads don't just lay a few eggs, they lay an apocalyptic amount of eggs. And their toxicity, added to their sheer numbers, is creating a completely unexpected evolutionary event. The life of a cane toad begins within an egg. One cane toad female can lay up to 40,000 eggs at a time. That's a lot of eggs. But usually when an animal has so many offspring, they don't expect many of them to survive. But the problem with the cane toads in Australia is that basically all of them do survive. These tiny black dots speckled down the string of eggs soon will hatch into tadpoles. And the pond in which they live will become full to the brim, completely blackened with them, killing most predators that try to eat them. These tadpoles gradually develop forelimbs and hind limbs, reabsorb their tails, while their gills disappear and their lungs develop. Once metamorphosis is complete, armies emerge onto land as young toads. And these armies are only getting more formidable. Between the 1940s and 1960s, cane toads expanded their range by about 10 kilometers per year. But today, cane toads are moving west at a rate of 50 kilometers a year. Why are they so much faster now than before? At first, researchers thought that the toads might somehow be slipping onto trucks and hitchhiking across the country. To find out for sure, they strapped tiny radio transmitters onto the toads. And what they found shocked them. The toads were not hitchhiking, but were themselves traveling at an alarming rate, up to 1.8 kilometers a night far further than any other frog or toad ever studied. Could this ever-accelerating takeover be a result of the army of toads evolving into a faster toad right in front of our eyes? While researchers can't go back in time to race modern toads with the first toads brought over from Hawaii, what they can do is look at preserved specimens of toads from decades ago. And what they found is that over a 60-year period, Australian cane toads' legs have grown over 
And scientists soon realized that the modern cane toads with the largest legs are those on the western front, the first toads to arrive in a new area. Later waves of toads have shorter legs. The cane toads that are able to spread farther and faster have much less competition, and thus there is an adaptive advantage in doing so. The cane toads were always spreading fast, but now they are evolving to spread even faster. This is all pretty worrying. Where we used to think vertebrates can't really evolve on such short timescales, the cane toad is proving that they absolutely can if the conditions are right. And for invading organisms whose populations explode very quickly, this rapid evolution is all the more likely and all the more dangerous. But the intense competition between the toads that's driving adaptation has an upside. The toads are quickly evolving a taste for themselves. They've become so numerous that their only natural predator is other cane toads. And while scientists have observed cannibalism evolving in animals before, they've never seen it evolve so quickly. Adult cane toads can be seen eating smaller toads, but it's their tadpoles that are doing most of the cannibalizing. Researchers found that a handful of more developed tadpoles can devour 99% of the tiny hatchlings that emerge from the tens of thousands of eggs in a single clutch. So in this instance, their immense numbers and rapid evolution is helping to put a cap on their numbers. But short of the cane toads eating each other out of existence, is there anything we can do to stop them? Australians understandably want the cane toads gone, but unfortunately, there's no great way to round them up and kill them. The government, community groups, and frustrated individuals do their best to cull them, but it's not easy and not always humane. The best thing is to get rid of them, get a big stick, and hit them at it. The current guidelines on the most humane way to kill cane toads is to stick them in the freezer. Some groups try to trap large numbers of toads using speakers to play the cane toad's song to lure toads to it. Other people just straight up shoot them with air rifles, hit them with golf clubs, or run them over in their cars. When I'm driving a car, I have no hesitation at running over them whatsoever. There are even toad-busting militias that make it their mission to kill as many of the toads as possible. But there are too many toads in Australia to eradicate by simply removing individuals. That's why some want to take a more intentional approach. Researchers are trying to genetically develop a cane toad that can only produce male offspring, using something called a W shredder gene drive. The ZW sex determination system is a chromosomal system that determines the sex of offspring of animals like birds, some fish, some reptiles, and the cane toad. A Z and a W chromosome will give you a female, and double Z chromosomes will give you a male. This is sort of the opposite of the mammal system, where the heterozygous XY gives you a male, and the homozygous XX a female. And in the ZW system, it's the egg that determines the sex of the offspring, unlike the XY system, where it's the sperm. A W shredder toad is a toad who's been gene edited so that all of its W bearing eggs are defective. That leaves just Z-bearing eggs. So when the male adds his Z chromosome to that, you get only ZZ offspring, meaning you get only male offspring. And if the W shredding gene is located on the Z chromosome, then this shredding gene can be inherited. With enough gene shredder toads in the environment, the number of females will be greatly reduced, and a male-dominated population would be incapable of effective procreation. Some may argue against this technology, saying we have clearly already messed with nature enough. But at this point, when the damage has already been done and the toads march on, we don't have the luxury to not intervene. We as a species already are playing God, whether we like it or not. So we might as well get good at it. We might as well do it in a well-researched, calculated way to undo some of the damage we have done. But despite their destruction, we can be grateful for the cane toads for one single reason. They are the subject of the single greatest cinematic experience a person could ever have. This whole video was inspired by a memory cemented in my brain from 10th grade biology, 
of watching the most hilarious documentary I have ever seen. Perhaps you too have a distant memory of a cane toad named Dairy Queen. Inexplicable camera angles, amazing interviews, grown men singing songs in the shower about cane toads while they stalk him psycho style, all textured with 80s synth and incredible jingles. If anyone could love a cane toad. It feels like a mockumentary, but it's all real. Like a love child of National Geographic and Monty Python. The cane toad problem is obviously an awful thing, but sometimes in the face of a terrible situation, all you can do is laugh. And in all seriousness, it's a powerful piece of science communication. This film's been cemented in my brain for 15 years after all. As I was trying to reminisce on this magical film, I wondered if I would even be able to track it down. And to my great surprise and delight, I realized it's on Curiosity Stream in its entirety. I almost could not believe my luck. If you haven't seen it, go watch it now. You will not regret it. And if you're like me and watched it years ago, go rewatch it. I promise it's just as funny now as it was back then. And make sure to watch it on Curiosity Stream to support this channel and other independent creators like me. Curiosity Stream is a great platform in itself with incredible documentaries, but it also supports us to keep making videos like this for you. And because Curiosity Stream has partnered with us, you can get in on an incredible deal. By signing up to Curiosity Stream, you now also get a subscription to Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by me and several other educational YouTube content creators. It's a place where we can upload our videos ad free and a place where we can experiment with new original content without worrying about the YouTube algorithm. By signing up to the bundle deal, you'll get access to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula, where you can access our upcoming original series like Real Engineering's Battle of Britain series or my upcoming original series about human evolution. There are so many original exclusive documentaries on Nebula from some of YouTube's very best creators like Wendover Productions, Tierzu, or Joe Scott. So by signing up at curiositystream.com slash real science, you'll get a subscription to Curiosity Stream and a subscription to Nebula for just $14.79 for the entire year. Signing up is also the best way to support this channel and all of your other favorite educational content creators. And if you're looking for something else to watch right now, you can watch our previous video, The Insane Biology of Venus Flytraps, or watch Real Engineering's latest video, The Truth About Carbon Taxes, which in Brian's words, discusses future scenarios of how to yeet coal from the electric grid.